we've made it to uh, this section of first peter and i trust that uh, you have uh, been tracking along just well in in our in our series through first peter i do apologize because i know that we've had some issues uh with our recording so when you're thinking about it um, this is a tool that we are using to help those who are unable to be here on sundays um, it's a youtube channel that we have with like four no two followers uh, there you go one is there <laughs> so, anyways uh, it's just a tool because uh, sometimes you're not able to be here and we get that and uh, or maybe you want to go back for some reason and watch it um, but uh, that's uh, that's available we've had some issues with our recording so I do apologize for that just pray with us that we can get something a little more fluid that would be um, be a little bit more reliable as it comes to that but um, we do have it available typically it is available uh, on youtube uh, channel if you want that that page you can ask one of us we have a link that you can send just take right there and i think if you subscribe it kind of lets you, you know how to how that works so um, we got a lot of followers so you have to we have to kind of wade through all of that we're pretty popular so anyways just kidding all right the title this morning first peter chapter one uh, four verses one through six proper recollection leads us to proper resolution and i'm gonna give you some definitions here in a minute but let's read this passage of i mean i don't even have my bible out help me danny keep me in line uh first peter chapter four i was gonna read my notes not that not, god help us here we go first peter chapter one verse one for as much then as christ hath suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves likewise with the same mind for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excessive wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead for for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to god in the spirit so we're going to do the best we can with god's help to uh, break this passage down for you and uh, help us see what god needs us to see this morning let's go to the lord in prayer Ask Him to help us. Lord Jesus, we thank You once again for this opportunity we have to gather. As I was mentioned in prayer, prayer this morning, You knew, down through the pages of time, who would be gathered this morning uh, around the Word of God here at Cottonwood Baptist Church. You knew exactly where we would be in the passage. And Lord, I know that our hearts should be open and prepared to hear what You have to say to us. Let, may we, Lord, please, truly just... Uh, come with open hearts, myself included. We want to hear what you have to say to us in this passage and receive it so that as we go forward from here, we'd be better, more adequate, reflect, adequate reflections of Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so uh, by way of uh, just introduction or maybe even sort of a remembering, reminding everybody, last week we were in 1 Peter 3. All right, we're chapter three, and we closed out with um, sort of this, 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 uh, the, the spotlight reflecting, pointing at Jesus Christ, the sufferings that he had. Uh, the, the title that we had last week was once. Uh, Jesus uh, suffered once. Uh, he paid the price for sin once. And uh, that's, uh, that's pretty key to a doctrinal position that we hold. Once saved always saved. We call that eternal security. The fact that Jesus Christ died once uh, gives us the opportunity to enter into His uh, presence, His grace, receive Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, and event, you know, ultimately uh, spend eternity in heaven one day. Because it is Christ's job to do the saving. If it was your job, then yes, you might as well enter every day. <laughs> You might, you might as well try it every day. That's what the high priests had to do. When it was on men, they had to enter the 
the, the Holy of Holies every day on behalf of the people. And if they had certain transgressions, there were certain ways, certain sacrifices they had to bring. But ultimately, Jesus settled that once for all. And it, it closed out with baptism. We showed that, how that that's a picture, merely a picture, merely a, an identifier with, a, with the, the salvation that Jesus Christ provides, not the means of salvation. Uh, that Jesus Christ provided that. So, in this particular chapter, in chapter 4, verse 1, he says, for as much then. Uh, that word is, whereas. Uh, how many of you have ever are, are familiar with uh, legal jargon? Huh? Okay, some of you. Uh, legal jargon. So when you see that word, whereas, you know, you think, Okay, now they're getting real fancy on me and they just, okay. Peter got real fancy with them right here for some reason. But whereas, what is the whereas? It's, it's almost like when we've seen the word therefore or uh, wherefore or because of yeah, the, the, the fact that Jesus Christ has suffered for us. That's what Peter's telling us right here. Uh, that's what he is writing to these, these scattered believers. Remember in the very first chapter to the saints that are scattered abroad? Now, there's four or five different uh, nation, nations that he mentions. So he says, for then, as, as Christ has suffered for us. Now, hold on a second. I want to pause for a minute because uh, you're going to see, or if you haven't seen already, that suffering happens to be a sort of a theme, sort of a, a running undertone in this letter that the, epistle, or the, the, that the Apostle Peter is being used to write to this, these believers. You know, some of us can relate to that, can't we? we? We live in a society where it's not necessarily uh, conducive to being Christian. Now that's not new. Really, it's not new to believers. Uh, it, it's, it's never, Jesus never promised it to be easy. Um, you go all the way back to, the, to, the, to even the days of the prophets and, and the nation of Israel just, just trying to, to line up with God. Uh, it, they, even they were facing uh, pr uh, persecution and hardship for living the way. So it, if, you, if, you, if you ever hear anybody tell you, oh, it's, it's getting, you know, you, you're going to have it so much better if you live for Jesus. You can just write them off as crazy as you. you know? Like, no, he's crazy. Right? It's not going to be easy. Uh, and, and by the way, somebody said once, once said this, and this doesn't necessarily relate to the, but if it's not, if it's, if it's easy, then it's probably not worth having. You know? Uh, how about, I'm going to step on some toes here. I'm just chasing a little bit of a rabbit, but just, just bear with me for a second. How about instant mashed potatoes? <laughs> Come on now, I got a little laughter on that. Man, if you're like, like good old southern people, amen, uh, you like mashed potatoes. You, you mash those potatoes. Okay, we don't just put water in there and add water. I'm stepping on a sacred cow because my mom uh, uses instant mashed potatoes. And sometimes she watches, so uh, I love you, mom. But uh, uh, the reality of it is you take potatoes and you labor and you mash those potatoes. And it's worth it, amen. Uh, it's worth having those mashed potatoes. Uh, because there was, but but there's some there's some labor that goes into that. You take the I'm learning. I'm actually learning. I've helped her out. Uh, you 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 peel those potatoes and and you put them in the the you, the boil them and then you make them real soft and you mash them up and you 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 know blend them and you put butter and all the good stuff. It's really good stuff for you, by the way. It's healthy. Uh, there's no calories. Uh, p potatoes are really good. But anyways. Uh, you know, there's work, there's labor, uh, as opposed to someone who's just going to go and, and pour some water and some powder in a thing and stir it up and then you got mashed No. Uh, potatoes. So, listen, okay, I should split the church right here. If it's, if, are you good with instant potatoes? Now he's good with it. We need to pray for him. Y'all know, just start praying for Isaiah right now. We, we expect him to be right here at the altar at the end of the day, at the end of the service. He's good with it. <laughs> okay, but you know, the reality of it is there's, there's something different about... Uh, same thing with, with like... And I'm going to get off this food analogy here in a second, but same thing with like noodles. You know, how many of you have ever had fresh made noodles? Like legit made noodles. Okay, he makes them. God help us. We're going to Dan's house after <laughs> church. But... Uh, <laughs> Fresh made noodles. I guess there's a difference between that and what you go buy in the store. Now, 
easier? Do they do they do they do the job? Yes. But there's something about tasting something that just you labored for. Listen, uh, when it comes to this idea of the Christian life, when we all stand before God someday, we all will, and we look back, there's going to come a point in our lives where there's a, there's a certain space of time, and Revelation refers to it, where there's, we're just going to understand the the, oh, oh, Romans chapter 8 is what, one of the verses that I'm thinking of. The sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. So can I, can I encourage you one, before we get too far into this? Can I encourage you that suffering really truly is necessary? And somehow, I don't know how it's going to be worth it. If it's not worth it here on this earth, if you don't see some, and God, He's a gracious God. He, he gives us peace. He gives us blessings. He gives us things to enjoy. Uh, even in the midst of suffering, if you're looking for it, you'll find it. You'll see it. He's good to us like that. Okay, but we can't promise it. We can't guarantee it. You know, just because you live right doesn't mean it's all going to turn out right. You have to just live right for Him. It's His purpose. It's His glory that we're after. Back to this. So, because Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, this is what this is the this is the challenge that Peter gives us. Arm yourselves. Uh, you know, if 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 we were going to uh, go to battle for some reason, and and we all knew the enemy was coming, okay, we're not just going to grab up a, a broomstick and 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 you know, and a duster and chase them down, right? No, no, they're coming. The enemy's coming. Are you following? The enemy's coming after us. We're not dealing with a we're not with, dealing with a pushover here. Satan's been at this thing for six thousand plus years, and we think we're just going to get up and and just fight him on our no no arm yourselves. That literally means to equip yourselves with weapons. You equip yourselves with a weapon. There is there is something about being ready, being prepared. For this battle. Because Christ has suffered for us. Okay? Now over and over again, the reason for his suffering was what? Can y'all help me? I'm th I know I'm throwing you a curve. That was a curveball again. I'm th I know I'm throwing this one out there, putting you on the spot. Can you help me? Why did he have to suffer? Sins. Thank you very much. That's, that's, that's it. absolutely right. You passed the test. You can get pizza today. No. Uh, sins. Our, our sins. Was it his sins? No. Because he has suffered for our sins. Listen, we should arm ourselves. We should be ready to fight the flesh. We should be ready to fight the enemy that's coming after us. Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind that's identically identically the, the same way that Jesus Christ uh, came to this earth he knew he was going to have to suffer he knew he was going to be rejected he was going to be despised he was going to have no place to lay his head he was going to have uh, people that that just absolutely doubted him and and pushed back on him didn't believe in him but he still did it so because he did that whereas he has suffered in that, for that reason, we should arm ourselves, we should equip ourselves with the weapons that is necessary to fight in the suffering. Because, listen, we have, we have uh, the Bible speaks about three major enemies that we fight. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, we, we tend to give the devil a whole lot more credit than he's worth. The guy's not as... <laughs> He's not as present as we like to admit. Sometimes we just want to blame him for problems that are really truly our flesh and the world. If we're being completely honest, that we really truly allow the Holy Spirit and the Word of God to shine the light where, where it belongs, we would have to come to the realization that a lot of our problems is our flesh. <laughs> and a lot of our problems is the world, the influence of the world. Uh, but, but, but I digress. We should still be armed because the Bible is telling us, Peter is telling us, hey, get yourself ready. Equip yourself to fight this enemy. Okay? Equip yourselves to fight this enemy. 
with the same mind. That mind is really the understanding, the intent, the thoughtfulness. Because Jesus Christ suffered. Now, there's been several different times Peter has already pointed this out. Uh, in verse uh, in chapter uh, 1, I'm going to just list them off for you. You don't have time to go look at them. But in, in chapter 1, verse 11, also in verse 18 and 19, chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, and then chapter 3, verse 18, also in this chapter later on, we'll be there next week, Lord willing, in chapter this chapter, verse number 13. Peter is consistently pointing his his readers his audience to the sufferings of Jesus Christ why is that why do you think that is do you think it could be and this is kind of where I land uh, do you think it could be because uh, in the midst of that suffering Peter was denying him and Peter sort of kind of carried that guilt maybe I, I don't think it was necessarily carrying the guilt and you'll find that out here in a second I think it was just hey guys man, let this be your motivation he suffered for you. There's a reason for you to just arm yourself. Get up and prepare yourself with the same thought, the same intent that he had. He was willing to face down adversity. He was willing to suffer for you and for me. And Jesus already took all the pain that your sin and my sin has to offer. There's no reason for us to suffer for, for sin. And he, he'll address that again. He's addressed that a couple different times. Like, look, the suffering that you have for your sin... Look, if you just keep your eyes on and your head on straight, that's not even going to happen. It's not necessary. If you're suffering for evil doing, well, you, you deserved it. I mean, you, 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 you do, what's the, the phrase? You do the time, do, or do the crime, do the time, right? That's sort of the undertones of that. But because Jesus Christ has already suffered, there's no reason for us to have that. It's, a, it's, it's, it's our ability, it's our uh, honor, it's our privilege to live Christ out and not sin. Right? Not that he's saying you won't sin, but it's like, listen, we have a reason, we have a way. Jesus Christ has already suffered. He took the consequences. He took the pain. He took the punishment. And if we can truly live in the light of the risen Savior, the, the crucified and risen Savior, we can have victory over sin. Pastor, that sounds easy. We complicate it more than it actually should be. We really do. Oh, you say, oh, how, how in the world, if I just live in the look at Jesus and I see his suffering, and, and uh, how in the world is that going to keep me from sinning? Let's take this analogy for a second. Let's say, for, for example, that somebody came into your home, middle of the night, and killed your loved one. Just killed him in cold blood. And investigation goes on. They find the murderer. They find the weapon. Happens to be a knife. Stabbed to death. Or cut their throat. I know I'm being pretty brutal right now, but just hang with me. Okay? They go to trial. They convict a person. And, uh, and you go to the judge. You go to the court. And you ask for the murder weapon. And, and you take that murder weapon... And, and you put it on your mantle. And every day, you look at that murder weapon. And every day, you go out and you hold it. And you sniff. Okay, now, y'all follow me? That's a little weird. We all would probably land at, that's kind of crazy. Why would you do that? That's the weapon that killed your loved one. Why in the world would you, I mean, no, no, no. We want to destroy that thing. We're going to take that down to the incinerator. We want all traces of it gone. No, no, no recollection, right? Nothing. We don't want to give it any credence, nothing whatsoever. But hold on a minute. That's exactly what you and I do the minute we sin. We're going and enjoying the same thing that killed our Savior. We're, we're, we're looking at, we're taking it in. We're holding the this very thing that killed Jesus Christ. It's your sin. My sin. And when we indulge ourselves and we dive in and we live in those sins, we are continuing to hold the murder weapon, so to speak, of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. So that's why Peter is saying, hey, look, no, look at the, look at the cross. The, okay, when you look at the cross and you realize that it was your pride, your lust, your sin, your disobedience, your lies, all of that that killed Jesus Christ, why in the world would you jump back into it? Why in the world would you even entertain that? 
Arm yourselves with the same mind. Have the same intentions that Jesus had. Jesus lived this life. He faced the same, same temptations that you and I do. He faced the same temptations. And he was victorious over it. Yes, he was God in the flesh. I get that. But he set the example for you and for me. And it can be done. How did he do that? With the Word of God. The Holy Spirit. He set his face, the Bible says, like a flint. He was ready. He looked. He endured the cross. Because he knew that there was going to be an Andrew Kennard that needed his needed a Savior someday. Because he knew that there was going to be a Steve Stanton that needed a Savior. He set his face. He was willing to endure the cross because he knew that there was going to be a you. And why in the world, that's, that's sort of the idea that he's playing here, why in the world would we go back and pick up the murder weapon? Why would we even indulge in that? Are you following with me? I'm not talking about sinless perfection. It's not perfect. You cannot achieve this. We will still trip up. We still have flesh. And as long as we have the flesh, we're going to fight that. And we're going to fail. And we're going to struggle. But listen, it's going to drive you back to the cross in repentance and, 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 and asking God for restoration. And, and as He draws you back into His love, it's because of what He did for us that does that. When we live in light, in the shadow of the cross and the resurrected Savior, Man, we can arm ourselves with that. We can equip. It's a weapon that we can use for victory. Keep reading. He says, For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. Now, <laughs> this does not necessarily mean that, uh, or, or this does not, some people say, well, you know, let's talk about Jesus. No, he didn't stop sinning. Jesus didn't have to stop sinning. He never sinned once. He was sinless. But this is what this is telling us is there, there, there should come a point in our life where we hit the pause button, where we cease from that, where we desist from it. Uh, we, should, we, should, we should mature in our lives to where there's a point in our life where we just, not that we don't sin at all, but that there, it, sin is not controlling our lives. There are probably people sitting under the sound of my voice and maybe even going to be watching this video later that are living still under the influence of sin. Sin has a grip hold on you. But it's because, yes, maybe you've gone to Jesus and you've asked Him to save you. That is possible. It is possible for someone to live uh, and still enslaved to sin after they've been saved. Because they do not truly trust Jesus as the, as the Redeemer, as the, as the reason, as the, as the way out of sin. We, we trust Him for salvation. He promised to save us if we call out to Him. We trust Him for that. But man, we, when it comes to, like, now we turn the page, now we're saved, now it's like, okay, it's back on me. I have to fight it. He's already fought it for you. He already took it on the cross. Man, I, I wish, I hope that you can get this. Here's what He says here. So, so that He had suffered in the flesh, hath ceased from sin. That, that's technically what we're, the, 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 it's pointing back to the analogy of the baptism. When somebody walks into the baptismal waters, and they, the, the, the pastor says, hey, do you, do you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Or the, or the preacher, whomever's uh, baptizing them, do you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior? Yes, I do. They're identifying with Christ. And what did Jesus Christ do? He died, so we're buried with Him, right? In, in baptism, and raised to walk in newness of life. Jesus, in Romans chapter 6, the Bible talks about we are buried with Him. You and I, uh, when, we, when we step out in believer's baptism, we're telling others, we're telling all those, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, that He died and was buried and rose again. But in my new uh, resurrected life, I'm going to walk towards a more sinless life. I'm going to sin less. I'm making a commitment to stand out, to stand for Christ. There's that. And when he's, that's what he's telling us. You suffered in the flesh. Not that I actually took the cross, but I suffered with him by, when I stood out and I said, hey, I want to be baptized. There's that, there's that analogy because he's already pointed to that in chapter 3. So then he that has suffered in the flesh, you and I, we stood out, we stepped out and identified with Jesus Christ. There's a reason for us not to sin. 
There's a reason for us not to continue in our sinfulness. It's a ceased from. Let's read on. Verse number two. That we, or excuse me, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the, in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. This is, a, this is key right here, by the way. This is really key. That he, and so in other words, if, if this, 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 that he no longer really could be condensed into one word henceforth. <laughs> yeah, that's a fancy word. Uh, henceforth. Almost sounds like some, some king, you know, standing there, like, henceforth, you know, like uh, medieval words or something like that. Uh, but henceforth, really, from this point on, uh, from this point on, the time that you got saved, the time that you stand before Jesus Christ and you recognize what He did, what, it, what your sin cost Him, uh, from, from that point on, from, 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 for me, August 27, 2013, henceforth. But really, hold on a second. What about today? What, what, what about right now? Henceforth. Because, let's be honest, if we all turn around and look back, there's a lot of regrets back there, isn't there? Even from the day that you got saved. Are you with me? There's a lot of regrets. A lot of regrets. We're not going to take the time to, to focus on that for a minute, but listen, uh, that's what I'm calling proper recollection. Uh, it, it, it does us good sometimes to just look back and see what our sin did to, the, to, to Jesus. And he's going to kind of highlight some things here in a minute. Uh, sometimes, hey, do you remember what this was? you remember what this was like? And we're not sitting there, we're not sitting there milling it over. And, oh, yeah, reminisce. Oh, man, that was, man, those were good times, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was so good. To, no, 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 no. That put Jesus on the cross. That cost him his life. That cost him the, 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 the ultimate, the ultimate death. That he was cursed, hang on a tree. So henceforth, here's the, here's, the, here's the point. When we properly realize that our victory is in Christ alone, so henceforth, so, so, so at the moment that you and I recognize, no, our victory is in Christ alone. It's not in some 12-step program. It's not in some, pro, some, 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 some podcast that I'm going to listen to every week. It's not in some... Now, that may be helpful. Uh, you might find a book or you might find something that will help you out. No, 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 no. This is in Christ alone. Uh, that when we realize, from that point on, we realize that, hold on a minute. There, there may be some helpful things out there. There may be some groups I can get involved in and I can, you know, be a part of this, be a part of that. But ultimately, it's Jesus that's bringing me the victory. Henceforth. That we should spend our existence. Here's what he says. That we should live the rest of our time. Spend our existence <laughs> in what we have left over. How many of y'all like leftovers? How many of y'all like, come on, man. Those things need to go. All right, leftovers. Uh, <laughs> You know, leftovers, it's, just, it's up and down. Sometimes people can, can live with them. Sometimes people just, uh -uh, I ain't doing it. When you just fix me something fresh every time, boy, okay, we can cause a civil war right here and right now for that. So we're not talking about that kind of leftovers. We're talking about what's left over of your life. From this point on. That's what that verse means, rest of his time. That word, those very phrase mean rest of his time. Listen, what do you have left over? Some of us have 20, 30, 40 years. Some of us have 5, 10, 15. We don't know. Maybe a day. We don't know. We might die today. What are you going to do with your time that you have left from this point on? Some of us want to sit there just looking back. Oh, man, if you only knew what I was. If you only knew what I've done in my past. Man, if you only knew. Man, if you only knew. And we come living that way. And Jesus, God is saying, hey, hey, I've already died for you. I've already paid the price for you. Live the rest of your time recognizing the victory that you have in Jesus Christ. From the time he came down off that cross, was put in that grave and came up out of that grave. Listen, we have victory. There's no reason for us to be living in regret and fear and anxiety over what happened and what's going to come back to haunt me. No! We have victory in Jesus. 
How many of us are sitting there living in, in defeat because we've messed up? And yes, we've messed up. But He's given us victory. He doesn't want... Listen, you think He just saved you to set you? No, no, no. He saved you so you can serve, so that you can minister, so that you can reflect what He did. There's power in that. That's what Peter's telling us. And I love this. I love this. Hold on a minute. Because what does this verse say to us? You recognize this. I, I hope you recognize this, I should say. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I've said this before. The gospel and the grace of God doesn't take you and drag you into the past. Uh -uh. It covers that and it meets you right there where you are. It meets you on a Sunday morning with negative 10 degrees temperatures outside on January 14, 2014 at 11... Oh, it's still 11 o'clock. We still got plenty of time. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, it, it's 11.40. He meets you right there and says, hey, what do you have left over? Not, hey, what have you done? Are you with me? Jesus doesn't do that to us. The gospel meets you right here and says, hey, what are we going to do with what we got left over? Well, let's keep this forward view here. Yeah, but you, you... No, 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 no. What do you have left over? Yeah, but you don't understand what I... No, 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 no. What do you have left over? I'm going to ask you a question, friend. What do you have left over? If you've got two days, live it for Jesus. Serve Him. Give Him all you got. If you've got two decades, just serve Him with all you got. Reflect Jesus. Why? He's already suffered for you. He already paid the price for you. There's no reason for us to live back there. It's already covered in the blood that Jesus Christ shed. Do you believe that? Why are we living back there? Why are we dragging ourselves back to the past and beating ourselves up over it? That's not what God does for us. He brings hope. He brings love. He brings restoration. And yeah, there's going to be consequences to our stupid decisions. But we can deal with that in Christ by just giving Him what we have left over. My friend, that encourages me. Because you know what? When we mess up and we can sit there and look at the things that we've done, and man, I wish I would have, and man, I wish I would have, and it, it, it's legit. I wish I would have. But God meets you right there and says, okay, what do we got left over? Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. What do we got left over? And we should spend the rest of our time. Follow with me. <laughs> to the lust of men. No longer. Listen. No longer. No longer. Not, not no. Uh-uh. No longer to the lust of men. But what does he say? To the will of God. That is the inclination, the determination, the purpose of God. Listen, we, we, we have our plans. I got my 401ks, I got my IRAs, I got this, my, my retirement plan, I got all this. I got it all planned out. What is His purpose for you? Are you truly yielded to that? Are you really truly yielded to what does God have for you? Instead of, what do I have for me? Now, I'm not saying that means we can't plan. Because there, there's a, a biblical principle of planning and preparing and being, being prepared and, and all of that. But listen, again, you might have the largest 401k and the largest IRA and, and you can, you know, millions of dollars in your retirement fund. But listen, you could die today. What are you going to do with your time for Him? How are we submitted and surrendered to Him and His will for our lives? God, how do you want me to reconcile what I have left? We don't know what that is. We can guess. We could all go to the doctor. The doctor could tell us, man, you're a pretty healthy dude. Man, you got five decades left. You're going to live to be 90. And I'd be like, what? I've got to be here for 50 more years? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But what if you told me I had five days? You know, when, when, when we're really truly faced with that reality, the fact that we, we just don't have much time, the world thinks, hey, go live it up. Enjoy it all. Why, that's self-focused. What this view does is say, hey, what can you do for Jesus? What can you do for His cause? Huh? Who, who can we pour into? Who can we influence with the gospel? That's what this is after. 
Though we, listen, that we should not live our time just yielded to the lusts of the flesh. The desires that the flesh has. Because frankly, we've done too much of that already back here. No matter how long you've lived, no matter how long you do, we, we got six, seven, eight, nine, ten year olds here, all the way up to <coughs> year olds here. <laughs> you know what? We can all spend some time in a lot of regret in what we've done back there. The gospel of Jesus Christ meets you right here and says, hey, no longer. Uh -uh. Yeah, there's some nonsense back there. From here on out, let's live to the will of God. Let me ask you a question. And I want you to ask, ask yourself this question. What is the will of God for your life? What is the will of God for your life? You know what we should be surrendered to as God's people? It's going to be a challenge to you. Ask yourself, ask God that every day. God, what do you want me to do today? God, you know, we have, we have things on our lists, on our schedules, right? Work schedules, uh, family schedules. But when was the last time you put God, like, first? God, if you want to interrupt that schedule, I'm okay with that. God, if you want to change that up and you want me to, I'm okay with that. I don't know what that looks like. God may, he may cause my, my, my vehicle to just blow up today. God, I'm okay with that. Are we okay with that? Like emotionally, we're probably not. Emotionally, we would probably be like, ah, you know, just a, a mess. But look, hold on. Are we okay with that? If God steps in and disrupts your world and changes your plans today, are you okay with that? Just in the menial things. That's menial. But I'm talking about even a little bit further on. What does God want you to do with your life for Him? It's not just to sit in church. This is just a, like that of what God has for us. Like, He wants the gospel out there. There's people out there that aren't going to ever come into here that He wants you to reach. Are you yielded to Him with that? Are you willing to let your life reflect that? But listen, if, we're not, if we don't know truly what Jesus Christ did for us, we just think it's just something that happened. We saw it on a movie one time where he died on the cross. They took him down and, and now he's out of the grave. And we just kind of treat it like that because that's how life works, right? It's a video game where you, know, you, you have 10 lives <laughs> and you can eat another marshmallow and, and get more lives if you want. Like, if, 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 we, if we allow our mindset to just, you know, ruminate that way, then the, this, the, the, the message of the cross is not going to mean much to us. If you truly realize that you're the one that put him up there, it was your sin, it was your transgression, it was your error that threw him up there. Not mine. Oh, yeah, yeah mine did. But it's easy for us to look at other people and say, yeah, it was your, I mean, geez, man, God. Are you sure you didn't have to... Suffer a little bit more for his. Are you sure he didn't have to suffer a little bit more for hers? Like, we're good at that, aren't we? No, no, no. He had to suffer that hard for your sin. He had to suffer that hard for my sin. And if it was just my sin, or if it was just your sin, then he would have suffered. Are you following? So why not? Why not, why not live in that rec recollection and go forward? Here's the, here's, let me turn my page here. I love that Jesus Christ meets us where we are. That verse, uh, look, no longer. What do you have left over? He's not stopping with that back there. He doesn't take you, drag you to the past and beat you up with that. He just says, hey, I know there's a past. I, know that I died for that. Let's move on. Let's take this time forward and move forward. What do you have left over? Let's give it to the will of God. See, here's, here's where it's at. Verse, thir verse number three. He says in verse number three, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentile. This is what I mean. It's not that Jesus in the gospel doesn't help us see the past. It's helping us see the past with the proper lens. So many of us, some, too, too many of us, if we spend time r reminiscing, we can get trapped back in it. We can start thinking about the quote, good old days. And all the good times that we had. And man, I remember when I was. Man, I wasn't. I had a lot of friends back then. 
I had, right, we can start rem reminiscing. If we're not careful, the sins of the past will drag us back in. Don't do that. What he's doing here is saying, hey, the, the time past may have been satisfactory in your life. He says, the time past of our life may have been, may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. That it's the same word, will of God, will of the Gentiles, the desires, the purpose, whatever, uh, the, the, the pagan ideology, the, the heathenistic ideology is. The word Gentile would have been, uh, uh, to the, these believers, would have been sort of the, the, the outsiders, those that, that didn't believe in God. Not the, not the Gentile that we know that uh, God saves and the gospel is open to, but in, 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 a, in a broad sense, it would be like us saying, the heathens. The, the, those that are godless. Okay? They don't get it. They don't understand it. And, and if you're being honest with yourself, when you were unsaved, when you did not have Jesus Christ living inside of you, the, the, the things of, the, of God didn't make sense to you either. It wasn't palatable to you either. I don't understand why I'd give my Sundays up to go to church and sing a bunch of Christian songs and give my tithes to the church. and What a waste. That's what the world thinks. That's the heathenistic ideology. Right? And that was, quote unquote, sufficient for that time. In your life, that was satisfactory. When you were living for the flesh and you were not, uh, in, you were not in, in, in Christ, it was sufficient to just live your way. And he's going to list off some things. When we uh, walked in lasciviousness, that word literally means to be unrestrained by law. You know what I'm talking about. And those people say, I'll just do whatever I want. You don't have to tell me what to do. The, the laws of God, right? The, the Ten Commandments as we know it. People didn't live with that as their guide. There was a time in your life, you, if you're being honest, you lived that way too. Okay, that's what he's talking about. There was a time in your life where you lived unrestrained. Just did whatever you want. Uh, he said, we walked in lasciviousness. Lust, that's the desires, the cravings, uh, excess of wine, that's drunkenness and overflow. And if that doesn't describe our society, I'm telling you what, I, I forget the statistics, but just in the Super Bowl alone, Americans spend billions of dollars, billions of dollars in alcohol alone, just on that one, one weekend. You can't tell me that this world isn't just enamored with alcohol. Drunkenness. It's, it's unfortunate, right? But that's, that's look, you, average guy at work, average lady at work, they, what do they look forward to the weekend? We look forward to Sunday. Like, man, I can't believe to be the church on Sunday to just get that refreshing, reviving shot. God's going to be there. We can't wait to meet. And they're looking for the weekend so they can drink it up. You know, they work all week. To spend all they got to hopefully start it back over on Monday, right? And they just just wasting, right? Alcohol and drunkenness and whatever else. It gets he, he goes from so so uh, drunkenness, uh, revelings, which is they just let it all out. They just party it up, just living it all out, living it loosely. Uh, revelings, uh, banquetings. That's a drinking spill uh, uh, spell. And just drink it up. Man, I've got all this money. I'm just going to go drink it up. It's my whatever birthday. You know, it's my, you know, whatever. Uh, you know, oh, the, 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 the Chiefs are in the Super Bowl. Or the, or the, you know, I don't know if they're going to the Super Bowl. Probably not. Uh, they, but the, they're, 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 they're going to win. And we're just going to drink it up. We're going to live it up. What? Like, now that you're saved, the whole, you know, Peter's saying, hey, why do we want to live our lives like that? Like, that's. That's how they were back then. Just loose. No law. No restraint. Just, just everything was poured into that. <laughs> uh, banquetings. Uh, and abominable idolatries. In other words, uh, this was illegal. It was illegal to have the, the image worship that they had. But they were still doing it. Did you know that as a Christian, that it's, it's illegal for you to have other gods before God? But you still do. You know that? To some of us, it's that television screen, that television program, 
It's that, it's that whatever, that vice. There's something that we worship more than God. I hope that's not the case across the board. I hope that we truly are finding victory in things. But listen, there are things that we worship that are just abominable idolatry. It's, it's illegal. Listen, we shouldn't have this. have no place in our world. No place in our world. But he's saying, hey, in the time past, that's where it was. In time past, that's where it was. Wherein, he says in verse number four, wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot. You know what I'm talking about. If you've been saved and, and out of a, a life and your friends kind of look at you like, dude, you're crazy. Man. Girl, you're crazy. What in the world? What do you mean you don't want to come drinking with us anymore? What do you mean you want to come out and, and party with us anymore? What do you mean you want to live it up anymore? What do you mean you want to just go have fun? Uh, what do you mean you want to go out and, and, and spend time with your church friends? What do you mean you want to uh, study the scripture? What do you mean you want... Uh, like they, that, that's foreign to them, the Bible says. That, that's what that means when it says they think it's strange. It's foreign to them. And there's a reason for this, by the way. In uh, 2 Corinthians... I believe it's... Let me see if I can... Yeah, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. My favorite, one of my favorite verses. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves, your servant, for Jesus' sake. You know what he's telling us then? Listen, the world out there, they're blinded by this. They're blinded by the God of this world. We could go across the room here and we all have opinions on what that, the God of this world is. Uh, we can easily land at money. We can easily land at sports. We can easily land at, 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 uh, at drinking and, 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 and drugs. We can easily land at all of these different things that we believe are the gods of this world. And they blind the minds of, God's, of, of, of the unsaved world to the gospel. And so what is the Apostle Paul telling these Corinthian believers? Hey, you're not preaching yourself. You're not living this out for you. You're living it out so they can see Jesus. There's a reason why we should let the gospel just penetrate our hearts. We should let the fact that Jesus Christ suffered on the cross to penetrate who we are. And transform us. Because there's other people out there that they're not going to listen to the gospel. They're not going to hear a message like this and just say, oh man, that was pretty good. No, they're going to see the difference that it's made in you. And they're going to watch you as you live your life out and you're just yielded to the will of God and you're just willing to, to walk with Jesus and be Jesus. Hey, they are going to see Jesus Christ in you. That doesn't mean we don't use the gospel and preach the gospel. That doesn't mean that because outside of the Word of God and, 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 the, and, the, and the Holy Spirit, someone will not be saved. But listen, if you don't have a relationship with Him and you're just out there partying up with Him on the weekends and on the weekdays and you're just living your life like nothing else happened, you're just doing the same thing you've done all along, why are they going to want anything different? God help us to be what He wants us to be in that. Do you understand that that's why they look at us as foreign? They look at us as strange. Because who in the, who in the world, who in their right mind is going to give up their time on a Sunday to go to church? Who in the world is going to give up their time first thing in the morning to read the Word of God? Who in the world is going to like be foolish enough to tell other people about Jesus? Right? That's foreign. But you and I have to live that out. Uh, because they are dead. They are dead. You know, the word... Uh, let me go back to First Peter. I'm losing my place here. And we're almost done. But he says that they... Uh, the same excess of riot. See, uh, they think it's strange that you're not rushing to assemble with them to the same excess of riot. That same excess of riot literally means uh, the, the, the same... Uh, like when they were broken. Or when you were broken. Uh, when you were unsaved. To, to just like overabundance, like excess of that. And then it says they speak evil of you. It's the same word uh, where we, we know the word blaspheme. It's the same word. Uh, not, that, not that you know we're godly people, 
but speaking evil, they're just going to rail against you. They're going to chide you. They're going to give you fits for living right, for doing right. That's, that's legitimately happening to people. And it's because they've said, you know, I, I just, that's just not me anymore, man. I want to live Christ. I want Him. He's done a difference in me. I want to do what He's... I want to do His will. I want to live to please Him. I want, I want the gospel to be so rich, so powerful in my life that they see Jesus, not me. Here we go. Verse number... <clears throat> make sure I'm, I'm following my, my notes here properly. Yeah, verse number 5 and 6. We're finishing it up here. Who shall give account to them that, to Him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead? See, listen... One of these days, we're all going to stand before a holy God. One of these days. And you'll have to give an account. You'll have to present that. Okay? For the saved, um, it's not for whether or not you get into heaven. That's not it. Like, we don't... <laughs> I know there's a lot of jokes out there. Be like, ah, you didn't do enough. You know, you have to pay this. You have to pay that. And, you know, there's a lot of jokes out there about that. When it comes to salvation, either you're in or out. Either you're saved or you're unsaved. Unfortunately, the Bible says, after this, the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die, after this, the judgment. You don't get to be saved out of death. It's too late once you've died. There's a, there's a Catholic, uh, whatever, Methodist, I don't know, there's an ideology out there that says, hey, you can, you can pray him out. That's not true. That's why it's important for us to give the gospel and tell other people about Jesus. Now's the day. Don't delay it. There's going to come a point where you stand before God and either you're saved and you're going, to, you're going to give an account. He's going to see that. Those that are unsaved, they won't be there. Okay? Look, you keep going. For this cause was the gospel preached unto them that also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Basically what he's telling them is there was, you've seen people die for the cause of Christ. They stood up for the gospel. They preached the gospel. And they were martyred for it. That's what they were judged according to men. That's what that means. These people that took them in. And there's stories galore out there. About men and women who have paid the price. Literally martyred their lives. Uh, they were martyred for the gospel. Because they would not stand down from the, from the truth of the word of God. Because they would not stand down from, for, for what Jesus it says is the only way to heaven. I mean, literally, uh, kingdoms and nations and churches martyring people because they weren't preaching their beliefs. They were standing true on the Word of God. That's what he's talking about. So when he says that, 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 that uh, we're going to stand uh, ready to, uh, before the great judge there in verse 5, but at verse number 6, he says, but live according to God in the Spirit. There's going to come a day where we all stand before God and God sees, okay, you're justified in what you did. But you know what? If we're just allowing ourselves to be you know, just dragged in by the past, oh, God could never use me. If you only knew... No, no, no. Because of what you've done back there, because His power is enough, and, and more than enough, and overwhelmingly so, there's a reason for me to live out. That gives me motivation and hope to preach the gospel even more. Listen, if Jesus can come and step down and save a Peter, Peter's the one that wrote this, right? Peter vehemently denying Him, vehemently cursing God at the worst time, the darkest time of his life. And, he, and Jesus can truly step into that and say, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep, feed my sheep, feed my sheep. He's giving him a chance. Hey, he's giving you a chance. You're here today. You're still breathing. He wants you. <laughs> Don't live in the past. Don't live in the regret that's back there. Yeah, Satan's going to bring it on. He's going to bring it on. I promise you he's going to bring it on. Don't live there. What are you going to do with your leftovers? You're going to live, you're going to live in the past? You're going to let the past just keep piling up? You're going to let it just keep... Because just, all you're doing is wasting more and more time on what you shouldn't have done as opposed to what you can do in the power of the gospel. So I, I, I leave you with this. We said proper recollection read, leads us to proper resolution. Recollection is, is defined as this. The effort of the mind to revive memories. 
It's, it differs from remembrance, which requires no effort. So, sometimes we sort of use that, these words a little bit differently, interchangeably in, in the English language. But when somebody just, like something pops into your memory, right, of remembrance, sometimes good, sometimes bad, we know that. No effort whatsoever. Proper recollection is me being intentional with my mind intentionally reviving something and in this case we are reviving the cross that's where we should go if we're going to go anywhere in the past go to the cross if you're going to go anywhere in the past go to the empty grave if you're going to go anywhere in the past go there and you can revive that and you can truly intentionally see Jesus Christ suffering for your sins Truly, intentionally see that, hey, this was wrong. I shouldn't have done that. They shouldn't have done that. This was wrong. But Jesus. Are you following? And proper recollection. Being intentional about what we say. Being, about, being intentional about what we think. We're not, we're not ruminating on the past things that we've done. Because that will drag you down quickly. If you're, especially if you're weak in the faith. I mean, even if you're strong in the faith, you can still be dragged down. No, we're not, we're not ruminating on this. We're intentionally bringing up the fact that Jesus died for us on the cross. Intentionally seeing His death, burial, and resurrection. Intentionally taking that suffering in, and it leads us to proper resolution. I thought this was interesting. We spent a little bit of time here, and we'll be done. Resolution is the process, think about this for a second, of unraveling, or disentangling perplexities. I have to slow down because these are big words for me. The process of unraveling or disentangling perplexities or of dissipating obscurity in moral subjects. That's a big term. Those are big terminologies, right? You've probably heard the, word, the phrase, well, I'm just going through a process of disentangling everything. I'm trying to reattach all the right things. Maybe, maybe your context is that you were kind of raised in an abusive situation or especially it's, it's a little bit more prevalent in, in, in church culture. People who are trying to just sort of like refigure out what exactly am I supposed to do? Like I've always been told, right? And if you grew up in, in some of the environments most of us have grown up in, some of us have grown up in, it was all about the man, right? Worship the man. Whatever he says, goes and he pushes his opinion or, or legalistic type ideology it is part of church culture and so you hear somebody say well I'm just going through the process of disentangling everything I'm trying to reevaluate it all right but you know there's a proper way to do this the proper resolution when you truly see Jesus that's your focus you can truly detach everything else and attach it all to Jesus. He's the answer. I've said this before. We've said it as a church. Jesus is more than enough. And when you truly let that settle and resonate in your heart, the, the process of unraveling or disentangling perplexities the perplexities of some person in your life that just bothers you, of sin in your life that just bothers you. It's perplexed. You don't understand. There's so much complexity in my life. You just don't understand my context. Hey, it doesn't matter. Jesus does. And he was powerful enough to die on the cross, come down in the grave, and be raised again. He's sitting on the right hand of God for you. Hey, there is a reason for you to, to uh, absolutely attach everything to him and live for him in that. So proper recollection leads to proper resolution. Yeah, you might find a podcast. You might find a book. You might find some group to talk to, a blog post. A Facebook post, whatever. And they're just all chiming in on how to get through this thing. And sometimes those can be helpful. Most of the times they're not. The only time they're helpful is when we're truly pointing to Jesus. Can I help you? Whatever it is in your past. 
whatever it is in your life, we have now and leftovers. We all have